Well, what happened to our most creative people? Oh, they left. They should be successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> Does that make sense? It is such a headache for a startup founder. People are leaving their homes to come to where you are rather than you trying to just make it with the talent here. It's really quite complicated. It's amazing. And have you ever recommended one of your startups to go to the accelerator? One more question uh, regarding this uh, disbalance, uh, regional disbalance with these entrepreneurship clusters. Uh, you just uh, described uh, how high is intensity of investment activity in Silicon Valley around you. They are ready to invest in students and in very early stage startups for quite high valuations already. Uh, Pre-seed round of few million, it is oh, yo, yo, very high for other countries, but for Silicon Valley, it is kind of okay, normal. Uh, but um, uh, why, uh, uh, why investors from Silicon Valley still prefer to invest in startups in Silicon Valley? Uh, there are so many amazing startups in Europe. And not only in Europe, by the way, in the emerging world, we see also sometimes diamonds uh, among startups. And uh, what I've seen so far, yes, there are venture funds and venture investors who live in Silicon Valley, who have registered business there, but who are open for investment opportunities outside their region. But majority are still quite... Uh, quite conservative in the way that they prefer to have everything in more or less one place. Uh, why is it so? Yeah, so, so uh, I, you know, I'm, I just dabble, so I'm not an expert here, but I'll, I'll give you a couple of observations. Yeah. Um, in, in the 20th century, uh, venture capitalists wouldn't even cross San Francisco Bay to go to the other side of the bay. And I'm, I'm saying that half jokingly, but it was kind of true. Um, so so I, I, think, I think we've seen in the last 10 years, uh, investors now branching out a bit, but they did that out of desperation, not because of anything else. By desperation, I mean, you know, there's just a finite number of great deals in, in one physical place. And we were kind of running out of great deals even though we had an explosion of entrepreneurs, um, smart VC said, well, maybe there are smart people somewhere else, but it's still a person to person business. That is, you know, uh, while, while you could get a lot of information via um, video conferencing, you still need to look somebody in the eye. You still need to, you know, physically attend a board meeting or walk around the company. I've made this mistake a couple of times in my career, thinking I can manage remotely without walking around and seeing kind of all the body language and all the other stuff, you know, it's, it's still kind of a tactile business. Um, and I'm not suggesting it, it will, that, that there will never be remote um, investments. I think smart investors are going other places, but, but it is still a, a, a craft uh, hands-on business in some cases, uh, or in most cases still. Um, by the way, let me jump back to the last question. There was one last piece that's really missing in Europe, um, and it's also changing, so it's not like they don't get it. It's just taken a lot longer. Stanford actually was the first university in the U.S., maybe MIT, that was an outward-facing university for entrepreneurship. As most universities in the 20th century focused on their smartest and brightest students, if you were a professor, and they were getting their PhD, then the goal was to make them a professor. Um, the worst thing that you could tell them is, well, you're not good enough to be a professor, so why don't you go out and like get into industry? That's like you failed. Um, but at Stanford, there was one professor named Fred Terman who said, no, 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 the goal of, goal of my graduate students is, yeah, we could make them professors, but they should also help the country. We, we were in the middle of the Cold War in the Soviet Union, and, and he basically took his micro students in microwaves and electronics and said, why don't you build companies and I'll sit on your board. And that was just unheard of for have a university, you know, professor again, MIT, maybe the only other place uh, that was going on and, and some at Harvard. 
uh, but basically he turned the engineering school into Stanford as an outward face. It was okay for professors to start companies, for grad students to start companies, for professors to sit on boards, for the university to kind of invest and get engaged. And, and that was a pretty unique culture and it was a pretty lonely place for a while. Of course, now in the US, almost every you know, university has their own accelerator and incubator and venture fund and whatever. Um, and professors now it's kind of like, okay, even in the 1980s, I remember if you were in a life sciences or a clinician in a medical school and you started a company, your peers really looked down on you as like, well, that's not, you know, that's not what academics do. Nowadays, of course, people understand that that is a career path for, you know, professors who do great research also like consult and make money and whatever and help startups. Um, I think that culture just caught on here a lot faster than it did in, in Europe, where there was a much more traditional, you know, no, we're academics and commerce. Oh, you know, other people do go to business school if you want to do that. But we don't do that in, in, in the medical school or the engineering school. Does that make sense? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we see now that in Europe, indeed, a lot of universities, a lot of business schools, they have their own accelerators even the okay. angel clubs or something like that. But honestly, from the general market perspective, I don't see a lot of student startups in Europe. And I don't see a lot of investors investing in oh. student startups. Uh, probably other way around. Investors prefer, and by the way, uh, what you said about culture, uh, difference, uh, <coughs> difference in uh, failure, culture difference in assistance and in investments, uh, exactly. Uh, just literally a few hours before our interview today, I had a call with an uh, investor in, uh, from Europe, from UK. And he was sharing his uh, criteria, investment criteria, asking if we have some good startups for his uh, uh, pipeline. Uh, and uh, he underlined five times during the interview that we should, uh, do, while um, selecting, uh, we should pay attention to the founding team that they should be successful entrepreneurs, <laughs> meaning not with failure with background, not with bankruptcy background or whatever, but just successful entrepreneurs <laughs> in their background. We make these videos in order to dilute geographical and administrative borders and to help you get closer to international investors, venture capitalists, market experts, and startup hubs, irrespective of what country or part of the world you are based in. And we need your support. If you like this video, please don't forget to put like button, to subscribe to our channel, and if you find it useful, I will appreciate if you share it with your teammates, co-founders, or social media networks. Thank you, and see you in the next videos. So you weren't talking to a VC, you were actually talking to a banker. Um, <laughs> he right? calls himself investor, yeah. Right, so, but, but that, is, <clears throat> that is the difference in culture. Um, and, um, and, and I think that's a, you know, unfortunate. I mean, um, you know, um, any country that wants to hold themselves back, no one is gonna stop them from doing that. Um, and that, that is the difference between the dynamism uh, in, that you see in entrepreneurial clusters versus the conservative nature. It's, um, you know, my favorite story is uh, post-World War II, the British uh, had probably a 10-year lead on the U.S. in computing. Um, Alan Turing and, and, some, and those early machines from Manchester and Ferrante were far uh, more advanced than anything the U.S. had for another decade. But the British government just, you know, didn't understand it, um, didn't understand entrepreneurship, didn't understand innovation and, and just pissed away an, an entire ecosystem of, of what could have been. Um, and you see that in a lot of countries. It's not just who does the first invention. It's whether there's an ecosystem to capitalize on all those parts necessary to build startups um, and and. and um, it's just kind of surprising that these lessons aren't pretty clear um, to people who want to um, build that in their countries. And I, you know, one of the things I, I kind of realized is that um, when I deal with politicians, 
and I was a public official myself in California for seven years, is that if you're elected, you want things to happen within your term. That is, if I'm elected for a two-year term, tell me what you could make in two years or four-year terms or whatever. Well, to build a cluster takes at least a decade, at least. Um, you know, because you got to change multiple pieces here. You got to change the financial ecosystem. You got to change the entrepreneurial culture. You got to change the university culture, whatever. And then the other thing I see with governments, whether they're regional or, or, or national, is, oh, I get it. We'll start this cluster here and it will be a jobs program for the people in this region. Well, that's not what the successful clusters are. The, most of them are magnets, are attractors of talent. That is, if you're just doing a jobs program, you might as well just hand money out on the street um, because the best and the brightest, you'll have some in your region, but what you really want is to be attracting best and the brightest. That's the test of a cluster that's caught fire, is that people are leaving their homes to come to where you are rather than you trying to just make it with the talent here. There are some exceptions where your country is so small, like Israel and Singapore, where but they still also attract stuff for from other regions. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, but in this regards, uh, I, as far as I know, to get uh, the visa and uh, to move to US, even for a startup, it uh, is really quite complicated. Uh, how it matches with the fact that uh, they should attract entrepreneurs from worldwide. So, so the US, at least in Silicon Valley, um, it feels like the United Nations. If you come here uh, from another country, you will immediately find that there's a ethnic or national group of entrepreneurs that have their own kind of club or network here in Silicon Valley. It's amazing. The first one that was set up was the Chinese entrepreneurs, um, and then the, very quickly the Indians. Uh, in fact, one of the biggest networks is now called Thai, the Indian Entrepreneurship Network. The Israelis have their own mafia. The Russians have another one. There's some overlap between the Israelis and Russians. Um, pick a country. Uh, the Norwegians have an office here. I mean, it's, it's great. Um, um, so it's tough to, get, tough to get in. But once you're here, there is another. Well, while we really don't discriminate about regions, people tend to cluster about language and culture and whatever. So you will find an additional overlay on top of the general help you'll get from anybody. Um, and you find people kind of investing also in their ethnic groups as well, because they know people from their old country or whatever. So it's actually a, a, a very interesting international melting pot here in a way that's, uh, um, I actually find fun because I, you know, one week I'm talking to the Indian entrepreneurs and then there are the Russians with a different set of like, whoa, that makes your head explode. And then there's there are Israelis and, you know, you can almost tell who worked in unit 8200 because, you know, they have one set of skills. And, um, um, you know, in, in fact, it's probably more interesting now that I think about it to, to think about the ones that don't have groups here um, or maybe the ones I haven't found yet. Does that make sense? Uh, so. So it's, it's kind of, and, and I have to tell you, I don't know how, how very hard it is, but it can't be that hard because <clears throat> I'd say in some areas, a third at least of, um, of uh, the startups are done by um, immigrants to the United States, whether they're green cards or permanent immigrants. Huge number of, uh, of startups in Silicon Valley are, are not done by, uh, by American-born entrepreneurs. This is all third you said, yes, one third. I, I'd say in you know in electronic design automation or, or some of those niche areas, you know, for a while, I would have said half of those founders were either Chinese or Indian, um, and and I don't know why, but the, the, and it happened to be a I did two semiconductor companies in my career, so I got a little familiar with that domain, and it was dominated by one ethnic group. Um, you know, if you're doing cybersecurity, it's probably an Israeli startup. Um, either here or, or, and what's nice if you're an Israeli startup is half your people are in Herzliya or Tel Aviv and the other half are in San Francisco. Or if you're doing a Russian startup, there's some people in Moscow and some people here. Um, it really is kind of a, which is different than um, uh, what happens in Chinese or I think even UK clusters. Um, um, it's, it's really surprising about how uh, international uh, 
uh, these uh, startups are. Indeed, that's amazing, Steve. And uh, coming, jumping back uh, to the lean startup methodology. Oh yeah, what was your question? Why? What are we talking about? <laughs> um, my question is, uh, how do you think you you invented it? How many years ago? Around more than fifteen years ago. Yes. Yes. And uh, since then, first of all, it it became popular so fast. How how did it happen that it became a kind of handbook for um, not every startup founder, but uh, I mean for startup founders um, in all the development developed yeah. world? Yeah. In my so at least at least two or three things. Okay. And and so let's. I'll give you the short answer: luck and timing. Right. And so. Um, but, but seriously, um, and well, that was serious, but, but on top of that, one is there was a time it was right when the dot com crash happened, kind of like now, people for the first time were instead of like everybody's going like this, now had time to think about maybe we need a different method to, to not spend a lot of money to make sure we're, we get our companies right what are the new tools and this happened to be a tool that was available to both founders and investors to say let's not spend a lot of time and money pursuing the wrong ideas is there a way <coughs> excuse me to reduce infant mortality so one was timing um two was eric reese eric became the johnny appleseed which is a, a, a euphemism in the in the states for a evangelist of the methodology he probably you know i was happy to be an academic and and Eric was happy to kind of go, no, no, you don't understand. You invented anti-gravity. We ought to tell people. And I went, well, okay, go ahead. Um, and he made just huge, uh, you know, wrote a book called The Lean Startup and it holds conferences every year. And, and it's just, just wonderful. The, the third is the adoption by the U.S. government uh, um, of my class as, no, this is the standard of how you rapidly take ideas out of a lab and test it. You know, having the government, the National Science Foundation say, well, this is the class you take, was another kind of stamp of, yeah, this is the right thing to do. And then the, the fourth one, which I didn't understand, was I wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review now seven years ago called Why the Lean Startup Changes Everything. It was on the cover. It now gave large corporations permission for the first time to use startup tools to deal with something that they finally had never seen in the 20th century called disruption. That is, this notion of large companies being disrupted by startups was a laugh in the 20th century. I mean, are you telling me some startups are gonna put a large, now all of a sudden some startups had more capital than a large company. Tesla raised more money than General Motors, at least for electric vehicles, and maybe more than the entire industry for a while combined. Um, that never was possible in the, in the 20th century. So now large companies had permission because the magazine said, oh yeah, use these tools. So lots of things came together. And, and by the way, it worked, <laughs> meaning it was a better idea. It was, I'm still surprised that people haven't figured out something better. And I think out of this crisis, people will build different generations of tools. This can't be the last and best tool set for entrepreneurs. I've been kind of amazed how long it's been sticking around. So, so the last piece was, it was clearly dramatically better than what we were doing before, but I don't think it's the end point. I think, and by the way, when I was an entrepreneur, there were no books on entrepreneurship. Now that stack is, you know, look at the library. And just on lean, you know, there's like a thousand books on, I mean, that's the, that just makes me smile. Um, uh, so, so I think it was the set of things. And of course, the internet allowed entrepreneurs to be everywhere. Open source allowed us to, you know, build on everybody else's work rather than everybody having to recreate it. Uh, you could, you, while you can't get $100 million in every country or region, you can raise a seed round almost in every, every country and world. And, and that's substantial enough to get you started and then get an airplane ticket to go to an entrepreneurial cluster where you can raise $100 million. Um, and, and so all the other pieces th that were necessary to happen, um, happened as, as well. And, and even though you kind of are rolling your eyes about how far behind Europe is, it's much different than it was when I, I mean, you would talk about this in France and people would go, 
well, time for a three hour lunch. Um, you know, instead of like, let's get to work and build a startup. So, so I think the cultures have changed those slower as well. So all that's happened. And, and I, um, I think it's, I think it's better, you know, in a perfect world, instead of giving all these financial incentives to large corporations, <clears throat> a smart government who wanted to, to really rebuild their economies would turn all the incentives upside down. They'd be funneling all the money they can for the creation of new startups and new corporations. And in fact, have disincentives as the companies get larger rather than the other way around. Because it's going to be, I mean, think about how our entire economies are structured, right? The people who have the, the most political power and the most subsidies and the most whatever are people who employ tens and hundreds of thousands of people through the, the rational thinking. Well, that's, you know, those are the largest employers. But, but given what we've seen about entrepreneurship, if we let a thousand flowers bloom, we can, and uh, it's a bad Chinese analogy, but because it'll end up in a different way. Yeah, I'm I, um, we could we could build a we could build a, a, a an economy from the ground up um, that while we'll have failures we'll actually see some innovative stuff that we've never could have imagined. So I'm I'm sorry I've been talking too much, but uh, that's no, that, that's amazing, Steve. Uh, tell me if you will be invited. But unfortunately, I'm not a government. I don't have uh, some country I'm managing, but. Uh, if um, some region in Europe invites you as a uh, manager, crisis manager, to build uh, the local st startup ecosystem, uh, which will flourish, uh, maybe not in a similar, in a different way, but in the same efficient way as Silicon Valley, will you agree and will you be able to build it during the next decade, for example? So I don't know if I'd be able to build it, but um, I'd sure be willing to run the experiment. I mean, is you know, we'd be able to test a set of hypotheses. Um, and again, out of crisis becomes opportunity. Um, you know, what you just said was something pretty interesting, which is, well, do we just want to build something that looked exactly like what we had before? Or do we want to use this as an opportunity to kind of try something different? Because you know what? our systems, the way we fund things, the way we build companies, God did not come down and give us a business model, right? <laughs> Maybe he gave us the Ten Commandments, but did not say this is how we should structure our economy or structure our companies. Um, so maybe this is the time to kind of experiment with, can we do something different to keep people employed and build robust economies and create a new wave and new generation of, of innovation? You know, I kind of remember the best quote is, uh, you know, when it's darkest, that's when men see the stars. Um, and, and, you know, or men and women see the stars is that, you know, that's when you can go out and say, wow, look, there are a lot of things out there. And, and now's an opportunity to do that. So I'll double down on what you just said. Yeah, it's a, it's a great time to experiment. Happy to help. I love this quote. If you allow, I will quote you everywhere where I can. I, I really like this. Uh, this I think it's it's a um, Emerson. It's a quote from Emerson, I believe. Um, and, but I uh, I think it's appropriate now. It's when it's darkest. That's when we'll see the stars. And so it's time to to step outside and and see what's possible. As a creator of Lean methodology, methodology, you mentioned that um, you are surprised yourself why nobody yet changed it uh, or changed it to anything else uh, or improved it. Are you thinking sometimes as perfectionist uh, that, oh, the time has changed and right now market is different, startups are different, maybe I should introduce uh, uh, Lean uh, 201 uh, or something like that? Yeah. And, and, and I want to be clear, it's not that people haven't improved it. Lots of people have improved it. But we're still talking about, you know, the lean, right? We're still talking about the, you know, uh, get out of the building, agile engineering, business model. People have done lean UX, lean whatever. I mean, lots of stuff. And there are lots of things we're experimenting with. Mark Gruber and his partner um, um, have written some great books about um, front ends. Alexander Osterwalder continues to innovate around, you know, more tools and more whatever, but it's still kind of the same construct. Um, um, I, I've been thinking that there's a higher order construct for large organizations. Um, 
because what I've seen in the large companies, we end up uh, we end up with innovation theater most often rather than just innovation, um, and that's been disappointing until I actually got in and understood what people long before me have understood is that innovation in a large corporation is only a small part of what the company is really doing. The company is executing uh, an existing business model and the innovators are actually operating at the edges, but all the processes and procedures and KPIs and org charts and whatever are designed for execution, for repeatability and for scale, not for innovation. And that creates a conflict. And, and, but, but when you're, and that's fine in a status quo, when you were just competing with peers operating at the same clock speed, but all of a sudden when you're being disrupted, either by new entrants for companies or adversaries for governments, if you don't have an organization that allows you to learn and change fast and tear down and stand up new organizations and politics gets in the way and existing rent seekers get in the way, et cetera, um, you're gonna be the X company and X CEO and that's okay for creative destruction in corporations. But if you're a government, that's actually bad. <laughs> um, you know, you can't afford to let your Ministry of Defense to go out of business because they've been obsoleted by someone who was innovating faster or your Department of Defense. Um, and, and yet the status quo and that size of that organization, whether it's the suppliers or whatever, have entrenched interests that that don't want you to change. So. How do you fix that? And those are the things I've been working on um, at a meta level um, to, kind of, to kind of say, well, what are the other pieces that need to change in an organization to make that happen? And I'm not the first one to think about this. In the 20th century, there was this notion of an ambidextrous organization from uh, uh, meaning ambidextrous fancy word for being able to do two things at the same time, you know, like chew gum and walk, you know. Like orchestra men. I'm sorry? Like orchestra men. Yes, yes, right, exactly like that. Um, but but it wasn't essential in the 20th, 20th century. It was, yeah, well, it's nice to have. Let's go. Now in the 21st century, I believe it's not, uh, it's not optional. It is, it's a survival thing. Yet, yet here's the problem. The people who run large companies and the people on their boards of directors or managing boards um, are execution people. They're finance people or whatever you don't have crazy people usually running a large corporation. You have people who are great at managing thousands or tens of thousands of people. And you have financial people who are managing the board. That's fine in a steady state environment. And I now have a heuristic, a rule that says I could almost tell how long your company's going to be effective is by the number of crazy people who are on your board. There needs to be at least a third not half, but at least a third of them need to be crazy. And by crazy, I mean be able to see the future while, while others are focused on spreadsheets. There need to be people telling you what's coming down the line or else it's going to just happen to you. So sorry about the digression, but uh, you asked what's next. And so what's next is trying to solve large corporation and government problems about innovation. Are you close to the solution? Um, I think we've been testing some and um, in, in very small scale. Um, y yeah, I know how to solve it. It just requires leadership um, with the stamina to do this because um, no one who joins, not no one, but if you join a large corporation, you join because you want to do something repeatable every day. That is most people come to work, to get paid so they could live the rest of their lives. Um, and now someone's going to come in and say, well, remember that job spec you signed up for? We're changing it. And remember, and, and so there's a ton of inertia f for just normal human reaction reasons. I mean, well, that's not what I signed up for. And no, I, I know how to do this job. I've been doing it for eight years. Now you're telling me I need to learn how to do something else. And so you have all this resistance. Um, and without solving those, um, and without understanding those and without understanding all the cultural and organizational problems, entrepreneurs just think that um, innovation in large companies are let's set up an accelerator, put posters on the cafeteria wall and have new coffee cups and are surprised when they, all their great stuff that comes out of their 
ex internal corporate accelerator falls on the floor. That is, never gets adopted or never ships. And, and didn't realize that they never worked on the hard part, which wasn't the innovation, which was the, all the organizational processes. They didn't build an end-to-end -end process. They built a, a point activity. And people have confused innovation in, in corporations with point activities when, in fact, they should be end-to-end -end processes. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And there are so many corporations now uh, from one side uh, suffering from a lack of innovations uh, yeah. in-house, but at the same time uh, not really understanding what they should do and uh, that they should change. I would yeah. do uh, Yeah. And, and, and by the way, it's not only in-house innovation, it's how do you integrate you know, M&A, that is mergers and acquisitions. How do you integrate your strategy silo? How do you integrate <coughs> all these independent pieces to kind of a integrated process that's not just a, you know, I, I have my own department. How do, I, you, how do I deal with startups? How do I deal with universities? How do I get a process of stuff? How do I do partnerships? How do I do these types of acquisitions? And how does it interact with the smart people I have inside? You know, the, the shock to me as an entrepreneur later in my career was discovering that there are more entrepreneurial people inside of large companies than there are in startups. The only difference is, is their personal risk profile. That is, you know, I could be creative and innovative, but I'm not willing to bet my mortgage and my kids' college funds on quitting the company. But, but if you gave me the tools, I could be as rapid and fast as a startup if you remove some of that bureaucratic overhead that, that, you know, I need permission to buy a screwdriver. Trust me, I've been in companies where that's true. I can't buy this cable. Well, why? Well, we have an approved vendor. <laughs> well, what's the problem? It takes them 90 days to make a new cable. Well, 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 what's the problem? I could buy it off the shelf on Amazon, but they won't let me. I mean, I've literally encountered that. So unless you build those kind of, um, organizations that allow innovation and entrepreneurship to occur simultaneously without killing the, you know, the core business. Um, it's very hard for companies to do this. How do you think, do private accelerators who act as intermediaries between uh, different stakeholders like startups, investors, corporations, government customers, uh, do they do a, a good job? Uh, are they efficient? And have you ever recommended one of your startups to go to the accelerator? You know, they're, so uh, are you asking me, are they good for large companies or are they good for startups? Uh, are they good to solve the problem of uh, innovation in big corporation from external uh, worlds? And are they good for startups? Yeah, most of them are great um, for, for their own businesses. Um, you, you know, if I was a large company, I would be figuring out how to pay them on, sh on products that ship, not people in my accelerator. Um, that is most of those accelerator, corporate accelerator programs that you hire somebody outside to run it are great for the accelerator company. Um, but I think a lot of CEOs are now waking up and going, okay, it's been three years, four years, anything gets shipped that moved the needle in revenue or profit for our company. And the answer, I'd say for 90 some odd percent of them are no, but we have great coffee cups. Well, what happened to our most creative people? Oh, they left. <laughs> you know, they, um, <clears throat> what happened to these great demos we saw? Oh, we couldn't get the, new the existing division to pick it up. Um, as I said, that's a point activity. A corporate accelerator by itself is a point activity. It is not a end-to-end -end process. And unless you solve, okay, what comes out of that? How do we take what comes out of that accelerator? Who's mentoring it? Who's adopting it? What P&L divisions have said, we will take these and ship these? And what, unless you have, have the food fights between turf that are really the hard discussions on day one, these end up as theater. Um, and I don't mean they're bad or malice or whatever, but the only people who tend to make money are the people running the accelerators, not the, not the corporations. And, and I'm not saying it's, it's the entire case, but I'm saying it is possible to do, but you've got to kind of wire the rest of the company rather than just dropping this in to, to, because the CEO says, oh, we need one of these because 
all companies should have their accelerator without saying, well, what's the, what's the plan here? Um, oh, you don't get it. You don't understand. We need to be innovative. Well, no, we actually need to deliver stuff that keeps us ahead of our competitors <laughs> um, that people want to buy. Um, well, what, what's that plan? Does that make sense? Absolutely, Stephen. Maybe you can give some advice to startup founders who want to work with corporates, meaning that they consider corporations to be their potential customers. Yeah. Or those who want uh, to create pilot or POC with corporation. Can you give some advice? What is the best way? Because it is such a headache for a startup founder just even to reach the right person in the corporation. Yeah, so, you know, selling to business to business is, um, I think it's kind of fun because it's an intelligence game. You know, it's like, uh, the, by the way, the biggest mistake I used to make and I still see my students make when selling to large companies, <coughs> excuse me, is confusing the user with the economic buyer. That is somebody who uses your product and you go, hey, well, Steve, I found product market fit. They love this and you're great. Well, can those users write a check? Well, what do you mean? They love the product? No, no, no. The, the, the guys or women who are typing on your product, are they going to write the check? Oh, they love the product? No, no. <laughs> can they write the check? No, I guess not. Well, well, who are those people? Oh, we haven't talked to them yet. <laughs> well, you need to, right? In a company, there's a whole hierarchy of users and recommenders and influencers and um, economic buyers and who's going to sign the check and all almost always there's a saboteur which means there's somebody who doesn't want you in because you're going to replace something they do or, or their cousin has something else or whatever it's almost a, a truism that if you don't know who the saboteur is um, you're probably not going to get the order um, because you need to figure out uh, who, whose interest this doesn't align with so um Selling to large companies are kind of fun for a startup, but um, n never confuse a demo with an order, number one. Never confuse a user with an economic buyer. Um, and, and never confuse uh, potentially a partnership um, with your interest versus theirs. Because, um, you know, it might be a company, it might make your company if you have a partnership with company X. But if they're a thousand times your size, they don't even know your name and the person you did the deal with is probably not going to be in that job in another nine months. Either they're going to move on or get fired or whatever. And your value to them is not the same as their value to you. Um, so, you know, you got to be very careful. It doesn't mean don't take them, but you got to not over celebrate. And the classic is of course, in the U S there's a huge retail chain called Walmart. Um, and I remember startups celebrating that where they even sold into Walmart and Walmart was going to, you know, put their products on their shelf and they were celebrating. And I said, put the champagne away. Well, we got the big order. I said, no, no, you've got the order to stock their shelves, but Walmart has 100% return rights. So if the things don't get pulled off their shelf, they're coming back to you and you have to pay the shipping cost. So why don't we celebrate after there's what's called sell through, not sell in. So these are typical mistakes that uh, young startups make. Uh, you know, I, this is a, a semester, a quarter's worth of advice in, in 30 seconds. So I hope this was helpful and, um, and uh, useful. Absolutely. Uh, we will put this, um, this advice also in the description of the interview. So those of you who guys... Uh, listen not too attentively, you can also read and double read and you should uh, really remember this because this advice is essentially important. Uh, Steve, just uh, to uh, fi finalize because yeah, I've just noticed the time, I'm sorry you are so, so knowledgeable and uh, charming that I completely forgot uh, about time of our interview. Uh, the last question for today, I, I know you need to run is, um, what are the major mistakes uh, do you observe in the startup founders which try to implement your methodology and play lean, but in reality you see that it is failing and they are maybe claiming that it does not work for them, but they simply repeat one and, uh, and uh, another typical mistakes. Yeah, so the, the biggest mistake I see is people 
saying they're doing lean and not really getting out of the building. Oh, I spoke to two people. You know, it, it, my students in, in a quarter speak to 100 to 150 customers while taking a full class load in 10 weeks. So when, when I talk about customer discovery, I mean talking to a couple hundred people. Um, and that's for all apps and running at least five to 10 different minimum viable products. Um, because it really is after a while a numbers and density game. You're trying to pull signals out of noise. So the bigger failure of lean is not um, just not doing uh, the process. Uh, discovery is about first trying to find product market fit. You do that with MVPs and trying to understand customer segments and what features they need, et cetera. But then marching through the rest of the business model, what's the right pricing? How do you acquire customers? How do you, uh, you know, get, keep and grow them? Um, and, and the rest, uh, the other is uh, um, sending proxies out to, to do it. And by proxies, I mean, if the founders send out a quote VP of sales, you've already failed. Don't even say you're doing lean because if you're hired a VP of sales, it assumes that you're already executing a business model. That is go sell this just by its title. The title, if you have a VP of sales and you telling me you're doing customer discovery, no, you're not. Because a VP of sales says I'm selling something. Lean says I'm still trying to discover whether the problem I think I'm solving is really a problem and whether my solution matches that problem. And then, only then, after I think I found product market fit, do I want to test it with validation with maybe an early salesperson. <clears throat> and so the, the early customer discovery and MVPs have to be done by founders who, who are the only people who could pivot and change the entire product or company direction a proxy, meaning a salesperson can't change on a whiteboard in front of the customer what the new product is, or they'll get fired. But if you're the CEO and a founder, sure, I can make up a new product on the fly. And that's what great founders do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Steve, right. thank you very much. Guys, I hope you listened it attentively and uh, you will remember and implement it in your businesses. And thank you, Steve, for your time and for your wisdom. Thank you. This was fun. It, time went uh, so fast. Indeed. I wish you good luck. I wish you great success of your next book, which we are expecting very soon. Uh, the book and the work, the big work about how to innovate corporations. And uh, take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.